So again, the title was using ChatGPT with confidence for biodiversity related information tasks. And um, in case I, I'm not sure if I explained it well, but ChatGPT is a online service that you can talk to as if you're talking to a human. Um, and it's an example of what's called a large language model, or that's what it uses under the hood to be able to do that. So ChatGPT is a large language model. There are alternatives like Google Bard and Microsoft Bing Chat and offline ones and homebrewed ones. And you can make one yourself if you like. But um, yeah, so I showed an example how asking ChatGPT for species information about where they occur, it's able to give me that information. And essentially this makes us ask, can we mine large language models like ChatGPT for biodiversity data? So they have this knowledge that's not necessarily available in curated data sets. Can we get that knowledge out and be able to use it for analysis? Um, that sounds a little sketchy to a lot of people and <laughs> it's rightly so because LLMs often make up hallucination. I mean, they often, they often make up information and this is called hallucination. Um, so we don't know when to trust them and this makes them a little dubious when trying to use them for scientific purposes. So in order to harness all the information that they have, uh, we want to find a way to say when they're being truthful. So our first step is to evaluate how ChatGPT performs on a test set. So we needed to build a test set. And then based on its performance on that test set, we train a confidence model to detect its mistakes. And I'll get into exactly how we do that right here. Um, okay, yeah, so our specific application is we want to use ChatGBD to predict species occurrences with high confidence, so it, it, it limiting the number of errors it makes, specifically um, for a specific species and a specific location. We want ChatGPT to tell us whether the species is present or absent at that location. And you can frame this as a yes or no question in natural language so that we can actually submit it to ChatGPT. For example, does Macropus rufus naturally incur in Gainesville, Florida? And the answer would be no. And it was brought to my attention that this name is outdated. So, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's the thought that counts. Um, and to do things in bulk, you can actually use ChatGPT programmatically using their web API. So this allows us to submit thousands of questions at a time instead of having to type them out one by one. So the first step in our process is to compile a test data set. And for this, we went to iDigBio. Um, so I, I downloaded a, took a, a somewhat large um, sample from iDigBio. So I collected rec about 10,000 records covering plant day, animalia, and fungi records. And I tried to get an even distribution across all the different phyla available in iDigBio. Um, the problem with that, though, is that iDigBio is like 99% presence only data. It doesn't tell you absences. So any model could just say yes when I ask it, is, is this thing present here? It could say yes to every question and be correct if I was testing it on only presence records. So to kind of el eliminate that problem, um, I created a synthetic data set of pseudo absences. And to do that, I took the 10,000 records that I had collected and I just assigned them random locations. I just overrode their locations with random places, assuming that if I take a random location in the world and I ask, does this species occur at this location? The answer is probably going to be no. Of course, that'll depend on the species, but it's the best I could do for now. Um, and then I did a little bit of cleaning and we ended up with a little over 9,000 of these pseudo absences. So in total, we have a data set with almost 20,000 records that we're gonna ask ChatGPT about. Um, so the second step, submit these questions to ChatGPT. As I said before, um, we can construct natural language yes or no questions. So taking a Darwin Core archive, this is just a, a few fields from an archive. We can ask a question like, does this species naturally occur in this location? Yes or no. So we put yes or no in there to try to convince ChatGPT to respond yes or no. It doesn't always do that. Um, but if it responds yes to a presence record, we say you're correct. If it responds no, we say you're incorrect. If it responds no to a pseudo absence record, we say it's correct, otherwise it's incorrect. And whenever it responds anything besides yes or no, like I said, ChatGPT is kind of temperamental. Sometimes it does what it wants. Um, we, we, we interpret that as ChatGPT saying, I don't know, or it refuses to say yes or no because it's not sure. 
And the third step, after we created a test set and submitted it to ChatGPT and graded its responses, we want to train a model to predict when ChatGPT is wrong. And we call that a confidence model. So for each question and response pair that we get after asking to ChatGPT, we, we estimate, we give it a confidence grade. And that confidence represents our subjective probability that, we, that the response is correct or the, the model's subjective probability that the response is correct. But what information do we actually have to make that estimation? Um, right now, we just have a scientific name in the question. We have the location in the question. Um, and of course, we have all the other information in the record as well. And then we have the models yes, no, or I don't know response. But this really isn't enough to put any sort of meaningful probability on its responses. And to do that, we, we essentially, we need more uncertainty information. We need things that can indicate the possibility of error or of correctness. So we basically just tried to implement every type of uncertainty information collection method that we could think of. <laughs> um, the, the most obvious one is that large language models in general don't, they're not necessarily deterministic. So each time you ask it a question, it might give you a different response. So if we ask ChatGPT the same question 10 times and it responds the same answer every time, we interpret that as the model is confident and it's, it, it has low uncertainty at least. Um, if it changes its answer every time we ask, or if it says, I don't know a lot, we interpret that as high uncertainty in the model. Um, a second method is, so language models are pretty sensitive to the way that you frame your question or that you phrase your question. For example, can species be found at location? It might respond yes. Whereas if you change it to, is there a presence of species within location? It might respond no, simply because of the changing in wording. And our third method was to ask it about related questions. So, so not asking it about species occurrence, but asking it, for example, can, can it provide a full taxonomic ranking for the species that we're asking it? If it can, we, we assume that it knows a little bit more and maybe it has a little bit more credibility in its predictions about that species. And there's a bunch more methods, um, but the point is we collected as much information that we thought might be correlated with the LLM's performance and therefore predictive of its performance. Performance meaning accuracy. To actually make the model, we ended up with 20 uncertainty measures to use as inputs to the model. And to collect these 20 uncertainty measures, we needed to collect about 70 responses from ChatGPT per question that we asked it, or per record that we were asking it about. And this sounds like a lot, but it's, it's actually pretty optimized. Um, when you're, when you're only collecting one word per question, it's, it's really not that much overhead to do. And to implement the model, we took these uncertainty measures and we trained a model that we used some machine learning methods, so specifically XGBoost with isotonic regression. It's not really important to know what those mean, um, but what they do is they, they take the uncertainty measures that we have and they learn confidence estimates based on the uncertainty information we give it. And we put one very important constraint on the model and that's that whenever uncertainty increases, it cannot increase its confidence. So we're, we're sort of coercing it into making low confidence or high confidence outputs when uncertainty is low. And when uncertainty is high, we want confidence to be low. Uh, going back to our test data set, we used half of the data set for training this model and half for testing. And now to get into results. So this is just a small sample from the test data set. It's a little bit cherry picked, but it's you know for illustrative purposes. So here's 12 questions that we asked ChatGPT. Half the time it said yes, half the time it said no. And they're all about different species and different locations. And we can see there's one, two, three, four, five, six incorrect questions, incorrect responses, and then six correct responses. So overall, ChatGPT's accuracy on this set was 50%, which is pretty bad. I mean, if we're asking a yes or no question, you could do that well by flipping a coin. So <laughs> that's, that's not great. Um, but as you can see, we have confidence values for each response here. So if we look and we see, for example, a 
0.36 confidence is really low. So confidence can span between zero and one. Um, so 0.36 is really low with relation to the rest of these. If we decide we're not gonna trust anything below 50% confidence, what we're left with is one, two, three, four incorrect responses and one, two, three, four, five correct responses. So now our accuracy is up to 63% if we set a threshold at 0.5 for confidence. If we up the threshold even higher, say 0.7, then we have three correct answers and one incorrect. So we're up to 75% accuracy. And if we up it to 0.8, we get one correct answer. So 100% accuracy. And if you put this on a graph, it looks like this. So the higher you increase the confidence threshold, the higher your accuracy is. Um, for for in, in the computer science um, performance metrics, we, we call this precision. So the accuracy on the subset of the test set that we trust. So for, 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 the, for the responses that we trusted, precision is the accuracy on, on those responses. Um, but of course, if, if we set our threshold really high, we end up losing a lot of, we have to discard a lot of responses, which is very wasteful. Um, and to try to capture how this works and on the full data set, and how our discarding responses relates to our increase in accuracy. We use something called precision, precision recall curves. And that's what this is right here. Each dot on this curve represents a confidence threshold. And the x-axis is the recall for that confidence threshold. So the recall is the percentage of correct responses that you assign high confidence. So if we set our threshold really low, we'll have 100% recall. So we just trust everything including all the correct ones and all the wrong ones. But as we increase our confidence threshold, our recall goes down because we're discarding more responses. But our precision, which I explained earlier, goes up. So the idea is if you're willing to discard more and more responses, your precision on what's left over will gradually increase. And you can choose however much precision you want, um, depending on how much you're willing to throw away. So for example, here, if we choose, we want 80% precision, that comes at the cost of 37% recall, which means we have to throw away about 63% of um, correct responses because they had low confidence. But this isn't necessarily a bad thing. I mean, we, we went from 63% accuracy overall to 80% accuracy overall. And you can see you can get up to 90s if, if you need higher accuracy. And this, this left graph was for plant or animalia data specifically. On the right, we use plant A records and you can see the performance is pretty similar. We got the same trade-off at 30, 37% recall. Um, here is fungi. Um, performance wasn't as good. I think it's because there are a lot of data cleaning issues um, and inconsistencies in, in the taxonomic um, classifications that, that made our grading not work out very well. So I'd need to talk to an expert <laughs> on this data to uh, figure out how to, how to get this to do better. But, you know, it worked for animals and plants pretty well. Um, this slide was just to say that it generalizes pretty well. It, you, you can use it to predict confidence on data that you, you did not train it on, is what this slide shows. Um, so conclusions real quick. So LLMs know a lot, but they make mistakes. So we should demand high reliability, and we need a way to increase reliability when their accuracy is not high enough out of the box. So I've shown a method for increasing their accuracy arbitrarily as high as you like. Um, and just to make a note that when I've said mistakes or incorrect responses here, it's all according to IDIG bio. IDIG bio itself makes mistakes. So there's gonna be some skew in the results. Um, and the general takeaway is that the more uncertainty information you can collect, the better confidence estimates you will be able to get. Um, yeah, thanks for listening. Thanks, Michael. Thanks. Yeah, that's amazing. If you can share those links in chat, that would, if you have a chance, that would be great. Oh, definitely, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. And I know there were questions for you earlier, and I think maybe you could answer those in the chat. Yeah, yeah, I can do yeah. that. But maybe you could read them real quick so people will know what's coming. From Matt, there was a question, is there a repository or a clearinghouse for the sharing biodiversity-related prompts? Um, mm -hmm. or for sharing biodiversity-related prompts that can be used to dramatic, drastically remove hallucinations. Um, mm. 
So for biodiversity specifically, I'm not sure. Do you want me to answer them or just read them for now? I think read them to tease people. You're going to answer them in the chat. All right. I'll answer it in the chat. <laughs> okay. What were the other um, questions? From Dima, we have, did anybody try to make their own LLM with alpaca or something similar? From Gail Kampmeyer, we have, can these LLMs see past paywalls? Exciting answer there. Mm -hmm. um, from John, we have, how do LLMs relate to ChatGPT? So I, I tried to explain that a little more in the presentation, but I'll elaborate in the chat. And from Matt Yoder, we have, um, early on, numerous prompts were discovered that would let people know the kindness, remove the kindness from ChatGPT, essentially transforming the persona behind the curtain. Can we create a biodiversity specialist person in a similar way? So can we manipulate ChatGPT to behave like a biodiversity specialist? That's super interesting. And yeah, I'll try to answer that. 